I've right. gone outside. Yay. Yay. Yeah, mine too. Andrew Lott. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lisa Unger Runes Christmas, which I think is a little harsh, but nonetheless, <laughs> this is a not cozy Christmas novella. And I think it's important to say that it's definitely not a cozy, but then again, you know, it's not it's not a horror novel or whatever. True. But we do we do have a serial killer, at least one, lurking in the background here. Now, Lisa, this is a novella, but one mm. of the questions I wanted to ask you, because at 258 pages, it's not actually that much shorter. You're right. But, you know, here's the thing. It was 180 pages. So like a novella is like technically right under 200 pages, right? Or, or at least a novel is over 200 pages. Right. But then the, the, it, it's so adorably stocking stuffer sized. It has right. this tiny little trim size, like. And so in the, at the end of the day, it wound up being two, what did you say? 253? Well, I'm looking at the advanced reading copy, but you know, the point is that it, it got bigger um, yeah. due to production values and other stuff. Personally, I think it's great. But I, what I, reason I mentioned it was that I wanted to ask you if you had any difficulty in condensing, you know, all your trademark background and twists and everything into a slightly shorter form. I did it. Like I kind of, you know, I, I, you know, I had written a, a biblio mystery for, um, for Otto, uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. And then he asked me if I wanted to write a Christmas novella. And I have recently in, you know, in the last few years, like kind of fallen in love with the short form. And I had had this idea kind of kicking around in my head and, you know, um, when he brought up Christmas, I was like, oh, you know, that would be perfect, you know, because I love a, I love a shiny, glittery thing, you know, that looks like one thing in the light, but of course, casts a shadow. And what better than, what better than Christmas? No, I mean, your, your book is actually set in the season, you know, I think, I just think, you know, we have a tendency to think of, of, of Christmas stories as uplifting. I mean, when I was a child, my mother would read us every Christmas, The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. And, right. you know, it's it's a lovely story of, you know, mutual sacrifice and makes you feel kind of all warm and, you yeah. know, all yeah. that. Um, and I, I think when we hear a Christmas story, we tend to think more in that direction. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there there is some, there are some uplifting <laughs> elements to the story. Sure. And- there, you know, it does sort of, you know, kind of walk you through the dark into the light a little bit. So it does have that kind of sensibility a little bit. And also like sort of the idea of, you know, like the idea of Christmas for a lot of people, it's like, you know, there's this picture that we're sold of what Christmas is supposed to be the same as like, there's a picture that's sold to us of what, fa of what family should be. And then often when we approach the holidays, like it becomes a very difficult time for people, like people who don't have, you know, maybe don't have that kind of warm family relationship or people who are, you know, have, have trauma or struggle with mental illness and the holidays approach. And it's, it's not very cheerful for them, you know? And so it's like to look at that side of things and like how, you know, it can, it can, be a time of difficulty for some people, but also a time of healing. Like there's a, a way to, you know, have that communion and joy kind of be a healing thing. So I was sort of hoping to, you know, walk into the dark a little bit, but also um, the light as well. So those of you who are now expecting it to be more like goblins than elves, okay. um, <laughs> the truth is there is, um, there's a sense of family. There's a sense of healing. There's a romance um, there's, you know, so it really does all come together from a darker side. Independent bookstore, of course. <laughs> well, I was going to get to the independent bookstore, right? Because our heroine here actually yeah. owns an independent bookstore in yeah. this small town. And um, while I love the fact that she can gift wrap like a pro, I also wonder how many sales she can do if it's a 15 minute a book gift wrap. So <laughs> have you actually practiced that? You know, you know, what's interesting is that at my local bookstore, Tom Below, last year, I went in and, and wrapped presents for them, like as like, just, a, you know, hung out in the store and signed books and then wrapped presents. And you are right. It does. 
it does take a long time. It was a lot of work, but you know, a labor of love. So I just said, you know, I don't know how much, I don't know, like when it gets busy, how many presents she can actually be wrapping, but it does seem like she's pretty good at it. No, no, she's very good at it. She takes a huge amount of pride in you, know, even using her thumbnail to obliterate yeah. the scotch tape. Yeah. I mean, you went the last mile there. Yeah, <laughs> and the, and the curly cues on the ribbon yeah. and all that, right. yeah. <laughs> so um, before we go any farther, I, I, as a bookseller, I forgot to mention that Lisa has very kindly signed copies of Christmas mm-hmm. presents for us, which are somewhere probably between New York City and That's us cool. this very moment, right? Exactly right. I signed, I actually signed all of them yesterday. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so they should be en route to you um, as we speak. Excellent. Well, I, I every once in a while, I have to have a book selling moment when I remind right. you. Yes, you- <laughs> <laughs> and it's like such a nice like the I mean the it just feels really nice and again it's adorably stocking stuffer size I think it's like a perfect gift for any thriller lover in your life even if that's you so absolutely true have you written some short stories for Amazon too don't I recall you've done some Amazon yes. shorts yeah, I I was approached a few years ago um, by Amazon to uh, contribute to an anthology, and that is actually uh, Amazon Original Stories, and that is actually where I kind of fell in love with the short form. You know, I think mm-hmm. that um, I had written short stories and you know maybe like approaching novellas earlier in my writing life, but once you know I started my first novel when I was 19 years old. And I, once I found my voice in the novel, like that was just my natural space. I mean, it's difficult for like, even my short stories are, are pretty long and that's, you know, like pushing the edge of novella with, you know, with the, with the two novellas that I've written, um, actually three novellas that I've written, they're all, they're all fairly, fairly long. Um, but like, I, I kind of fell in love with the form pretty recently. And so I've been doing, a, a short story every uh, a kind of a long short story every year for for Amazon and then I did one for Otto for uh, for his biblio mystery series and now and now this novella so well I mean it's wonderful a lot of people can write it can't manage it can't do the you know the long form and the short form I always yeah. in awe of Jeffrey Deaver who you know can write staggeringly long thrillers and then turn yeah. around and you know write you know, a short story a week or something. Um, yeah, he loves that. He loves the form. In fact, we were in an anthology together and he was like, I wish I could just write short stories. And I understand what he means because there's like this intensity to it, you know, and it ha- and it's like very, you know, like I was on vacation and I had this idea for a short story and I wanted to, you know, writing it in the mornings when I was on vacation. It was completely like not anything to do with anything else that I had going on. But it's like there's like this an intense burst of creativity and this energy and it's like a little tiny vacation from the other stuff that you're working on. And so for me, it's been you know, really great. So I, I know what he means when he's like, I, he loves doing it and he's so great at it. He is very good at it. He's been nominated for tens of awards. He's going to be with us on November 28th with the new Lincoln Rhyme novel. Oh, you know, he also TikToks back and forth with characters too. I mean, you know, yeah. every book is not a Lincoln Rhyme, just as you right. write a lot of different things. But anyway, okay. let's go back to um, Christmas presents and talk about this young woman who, yeah. um, Madeline, Madeline yeah. Martin, I love that, euphonious, Madeline Martin mystery, you know, M's, all those good things. Yeah. Nice. And she has she has had a deep trauma in her life. And so really, also her father has had a stroke. Her father was in law enforcement, but so she has to take care of him. So she's got this little bookstore, which is a safe space for her. She's wrapping presents, as we mentioned. She has yeah. book clubs that meet there, you know. I mean, it's all very good. And then and then a guy named Harley shows up. So mm-hmm. Tell us about Harley Granger. Yeah. So Harley Granger is a podcaster and a writer. um, And he has had a couple of successful outings with, you know, reopening cold cases and even, um, you know, uh, accomplishing a new trial. And he is a failed fiction writer. So he was originally a fiction writer and he, um, you know, kind of published a few books and, 
they didn't do well. And uh, then he's like, you know, at a bar with his friend who got laid off from a national radio show as a producer. And so the two of them come kind of come up with this idea to create uh, a podcast, a true crime podcast. And they, um, they kind of embark on, on this idea and he finds that, you know, his gift for storytelling, for, you know, for research and for digging into character, you know, makes him maybe, you know, maybe he's not the best novelist, but he is a really excellent podcaster and, you know, a nonfiction writer. And so he becomes very, very successful. And so he winds up um, at Madeline's store a couple of days before Christmas, you know, he buys a, a book for his, his father and um, he's got some questions for Madeline regarding the, um, the, the trauma that she suffered 10 years earlier. And she sort of, you know, has kind of found her way to normal after surviving a brutal attack and uh, her best friend was killed and two of her other friends are gone. And um, missing and um, nobody knows what's happened to them. And so she's like sort of the last survi survivor of this, of, uh, of a man by the name of Evan Handy. And he's um, in prison for these crimes. So she's kind of, I mean, she's, she's moved past it, but of, of course she hasn't. And it's still sort of, you know, as Christmas approaches, it's like this moment for her where, everything kind of comes back again because it's that time of year where, where everything happened. Um, and then, uh, then Harley shows up in the store and he has questions that, you know, she has no desire to answer, but sort of finds that she has to. Very true. So Harley is the instigating incident. Yes. You know, a podcaster is an absolute gift to a crime writer. You know, I mean, the sort of private eye is, is kind of, you know, passe these days because instead of, you know, instead of being gumshoes and, you know, beating feet on the street, they're yeah. home, you know, beating the keys and it's a whole different world. And so there's a real, there's a real wealth of podcasters that are appearing in crime fiction, sometimes as detectives, sometimes as instigators. And, you know, I'm, I'm a child of the 1940s, you know, I was born in 1940, so I grew up on radio. That's and I right. find the whole thing kind of funny because, you know, podcasting is basically taking us back to radio. You know, Absolutely. when I was a kid, the Lux Radio Theater, you know, I would hide under the covers that came out at eight o'clock at night past my bedtime. And, you know, so I would take my little radio and kind of, you know, get under the covers and listen to the scary stuff like suspense and all. And, yeah. and I think that the podcaster and this obsession that we are developing for true crime because that's the thing that podcasters seem, many podcasters seem to focus on. Yes. is really kind of, you know, dropping me back, you know, 70 some years, more than that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, in the whole sort of, you know, the, the sudden like sort of real popularity of podcasts, I think, I think it's, it's maybe in some ways it's like a reaction to just being overwhelmed by the screen all the time. You know, you're always on your screen, you're working, you're watching, you're, you know, you've got your phone and like literally every, you know, element of your life now is like controlled on this phone, your grocery shopping, your doorbell, like the whole, the whole thing. And I think it's like a moment where people just want to like, I need to just, you know, listen and not look at something. And I know that for me, it, it definitely, it definitely serves that purpose. And then of course, as a novelist, you know, I'm just a, a news junkie, you know, I just can't take in enough information, you know, like I'm constantly reading and researching and listening to things. And so the podcast really provides another opportunity for me to, you know, um, to, to learn, you know, about, about crime, I mean, which is something that I think, when we talk about crime, you know, we're really talking about humanity, right? You know, the criminality of any culture basically reflects, you know, the mores and the the sickness and whatever it is that's going on in our culture can be reflected in our criminality. And true crime podcasting is like basically just long form journalism. And it's a way to really dig into motive and to procedure and all that stuff. And it's it is it's a real gift to to crime fiction writers because there's so there's so much to learn and such a you know palatable way to learn it. Absolutely, I mean it kind of combines it's it combines reporting and storytelling yeah. Yeah. and you know and we certainly noticed when when Zoom came along, which you know mercifully came along when COVID came along, and so yeah. we have this great tool. 
my husband said to me, you know, not everybody's going to want to sit and watch it. Although I will say, if you're watching it, you know, you can go to YouTube and you can watch all of our author interviews on your smart television if you go to YouTube. But anyway, he said, you know, I think I can take the soundtracks and I can turn them into podcasts. So he's at 256,000 downloads. Wow. Our author conversations, which really makes the point that people don't always want to, you know, sit in front of a screen and watch us. They can listen to us. Okay. You can listen while you're driving or while you're exercising or doing the laundry or whatever. Or gardening or, you know, or knitting or all kinds of things. And I think um, I think, you know, storytelling was originally, if you want to go all the way back to the birds and all, it was all oral. Of you know, it was an oral tradition, which is why there are all these mnemonics and Homer and other okay. things, because people would memorize chunks and then they'd have to have a mnemonic like the Wine Dark Sea or Wiley Odysseus. And, right. you know, that would then put them into the next chunk, you know, of whatever it is they'd learned. And I mean, so it's it's not unusual at all in the history yeah. of you know storytelling that we would take it in orally yes other than you know than read it yeah so, 100 i mean it's like you know the those are the first stories ever told or ever that we ever told to ourselves about ourselves it's an oral tradition i mean that's where it all begins and so it, it's it's interesting to see how like story, you know, storytelling evolves, you know, uh, or how people consume story evolves. But, you know, it's funny to have watched like over over these, you know, many years in publishing, like, you know, there's the hardcover, and then there's the paperback, and then there's the ebook. And now there's like, and then all of a sudden, like now audiobook is having like such a huge resurgence as well, I think, because of the pot, I think, because of the the podcasts. And then, you know, we all just kind of come back to this original tradition, but we're still just, you know, telling ourselves stories about, about ourselves. Well, we are. I mean, the phone is a, is a small portable device. It's not like you're lugging along a radio. Exactly. You know, um, or, you, you know, you're anchored to your car radio. I mean, I can remember we used to go on family visits on Sunday afternoon and um, I, I wasn't too crazy about visiting with the old folks. So I would stay in the car and have the car radio on and listen to like the Green Hornet or, you know, exactly. whatever, whatever it was. But you were anchored to the place where the radio was. But now right. with the phone, you know, you can you can go anywhere. So I think, you know, I think it's great. I also think it in, it in many ways can encourage shorter form, although my husband, for example, was completely hooked of all things on the Harry Potter series because he adored the the, the uh, narrator. Yeah, yeah. And so people can get attached, I think, you oh, know, they- narrators. Yeah, yeah. And I've had the, for my longer novels, I've had the same narrator now for, um, I think like the last, since Under My Skin, Vivian Lahaney. And, you know, she's really, she's really excellent. And, you know, um, that I can see how readers or, you know, audiobook listeners get attached to that voice, you know, or the, her, the essence that she brings to the books, which is, you know, something of her own, um, that I just, I, I personally just love and always feel very like inspired. Like I, I probably, I don't generally pick up the book and read it again, you know, like, unless I'm doing reading, but I'm not going to like read it cover to cover because it's too, um, you know, uh, frustrating. Cause I feel like I would basically like rewrite everything that, <laughs> that, I, that I have ever written. I'd be like, if once I start, once I'm in there reading, I'm like, I, oh, I could have done that better. But like listening to it, um, you know, like I was listening to the audio version of Christmas Presents and listening to it, like the um, Jennifer Pickens, who's the audio uh, narrator for this, her voice too is also really hypnotic. And it kind of just like lulled me into that space, like, and it felt very different from, you know, from what I had written, like it was a different experience for me. So I think that might be something to do with it too. It's like a... that story I mean, the rhythm of it would be different you know i mean the rhythm of listening to it and the narrator's voice would be different than the pacing that you yeah. know that that you're reading but anyway i can tell you from personal experience that bookstores don't make money off audiobooks they don't. Um, or ebooks and so at the end of the day if you want to have a successful bookstore you still have to actually sell 
physical books to people. Better be physical books. <laughs> yep. Um, and so Madeline, here she is in her little bookshop, and she has come up with um, some community-centered things that help generate um, income. And I, I really liked her her discussion club idea, you know, and the gift yeah. wrap and all those other things. Lisa's been to a lot of bookstores, so she kind of knows how we work. Yeah, I feel like I'm a, <laughs> so I'm an honorary bookstore owner. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Anyway, so here comes Harley and Madeline's, yeah. you know, kind of little safe, safe space that she has created yeah. for herself and become comfortable in. He asks her some questions, and he's clearly going to raise ghosts from the past. Um, yeah. It's a Dickensian thing there right now, you know, the Christmas Carol kind of thing. Um, he's going to raise ghosts from the past that are going to um, penetrate this this little safe space that she has acquired. So yeah. one needs to hope that for her, it will not be a tragedy. But, you know, we don't know that. And we're not going to tell you either, because otherwise you won't read the book. That's right. And yeah, and I think it's just kind of an interesting thing about her when I first, you know, when I first started like spending time with her on the page, I just had that at the sense of her as being very cocooned, you know, she like sort of built this little world and, you know, she, she never, you know, she never left the town where this horrible thing happened. And so it's always kind of present, you know, people, you know, she never, she talks about it in the book, how she never, um, she can never be anything else other than that girl who was um, was victimized, and yet you know she didn't move from the town, right? To um, to like you know leave and start something new. She stayed, and she, you know she stayed with her dad, and her mom had you know has left, and she's she's gone off to to do other things, um, and is married to her father anymore. But Madeline has always stayed, and you know, I felt that she was cocooned and that this moment though, even though it's a painful one, I think is a necessary one for her that she needs to take a look at some things that she has, um, you know, really sought to, um, oh, did I lose you, Barbara? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I should keep talking or not. <laughs> um, I guess I, I think I will it just- like, It looks like she dropped out. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, so are, we still, are we still live? I can keep talking. I can keep talking. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and keep talking. We're still live. Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So I feel like in a sense, it was like kind of, you know, it was a necessary moment for her. Like she would have preferred to, um, you know, to stay in her little bubble or her little cocoon, but now, you know, the past has come back and Harley is, you know, um, convinced her that you know it's not the the situation is not really past it's it's kind of it's kind of alive and well um do do we have any are there any questions or anything in the chat that i should answer or yeah let me see okay um if anyone does have questions i can read them out now uh for the time being yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I can just, I mean, I can, I'm sure I can come up with a, a lot of different things to say about the book. So, um, yeah, so I also is a very, so part of the inspiration for the book, in addition to, you know, wanting to kind of set it at Christmas was um, the idea of the podcast and how um, in the narration of, uh, of crime of, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. Why did you talking? I'm really glad. Um, I don't know if there was a glitch in the neighborhood or what, but all of a sudden, there we were. <laughs> <laughs> I really apologize, but, you know, technology's yeah, not yeah. perfect. So where did yeah. you take us? Oh, yeah. So I was going to start talking about, you know, like the, the, like the basic inspiration for the book is like kind of the idea of the podcast and the eth the ethics of podcasting. So Harley has taken some, you know, some heat for his techniques and you know how he's gotten information from people and maybe some lies that he's told. And so there's some sense of him as being as as being unethical 
um, there's a, there's a, at one point Badger, you know, accuses him of that, of that outright of exploiting people's pain and turning it into a story where people who have actually been harmed become characters. And so in some ways they're dehumanizing the, the very painful traumatic events that happen and using them to entertain and to, um, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to sell books or, you know, advertising or whatever it is in that way. But, you know, so that, that's something that I've been very interested in because I have in myself been listening to podcasts and, you know, some of the events that you're take, ta- you know, thinking about are like, you know, they're, they're quite horrific, you know, and yet there's something about the telling of it or the narrating of it that sort of, you know, um, maybe underplays that a little bit or doesn't give it enough, doesn't give it enough weight. Well, and, and there's always this question. I hope I don't keep disappearing. I don't know what's going on with our internet connection. I think you're okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it's it's ours. It, it just does this every once in a while. Anyway, um, I think there's a question too of, you know, who owns the story? I mean, exactly. you know, if you're, yeah. if you're writing about people, can you get everyone's permission? Or that kind of thing. Yeah. And do you need everybody's Have you lost me again? Oh, no. I don't think so. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. No, I can. But I mean, I I thought about that, you know, because there's such a thing going on right now about, you know, you have to be authentic to tell a story, you know, if you're not, you know, whatever culture or religion or ace or sex or whatever it is. Sure. And then you shouldn't be telling the story. And so I'm wondering with podcasting, you know, you're you're bringing in a lot of people and you don't necessarily have their their permission to do right. that. Exactly. And I also think that there's, you know, it's an interesting, you know, um, there was a uh, an article that uh, Sarah Wyman wrote for the cut um, a while back about the the uh, the Central Park Five and the travesty of justice there, but also, you know, the sort of lesser discussed travesty of the fact that the um, the person who was actually guilty of beating and, and raping the Central Park jogger went, went free and went on, you know, to rape and kill five more women. And that there's like, so there's a, this lesser known, like sort of piece about like, you know, sometimes we forget about the victims, you know, like they're in, in our culture, we can be so, um, you know, so fascinated by uh, the killer or the person who does the the wrong thing and so much energy and um, attention and heat is attached to that, that personality type, that like dark triad personality that we're also fascinated with. And then forget about the women, you know, that were, that were victimized. And, you know, I think that that's something that, that has come up for me in this book, in Christmas presents, and also in my, uh, my upcoming book, New Couple in 5B, you know, just the kind of idea that, you know, in our, in our journalism and in our uh, investigations or opening of cold cases and whatnot, to remember that there are real victims that need compassion and the, their families and their suffering. And it's not just a retelling of like, you know, what this type, this personality type has done. Well, I do find that our focus is very often on the criminal. I mean, you know, this whole horrific thing going on in Maine at the moment. I have reached the point, There's, I'm not being very humane here. I've really reached the point where I wish that all of those guys, you know, end up dead so that nobody has to live through the the trial and the, you know. I mean, there's no coming back from doing something like that. And- I mean, exactly. You know, and there's very often, you know, they very, all these events very often end in a suicide. Um, and, you know, I think that it, at least people, the the families and the survivors don't have to live through all of that trauma. I again. used to get annoyed at serial killing novels where in the end, yeah. There's one in particular, I can still remember how annoyed I was that basically the only person who survived was the serial killer. And, you know, there were dead women all over the place and all, but, you know, but he made it through. And I thought, 
our justice system is so full of holes right now that there's no guarantee that, you know, that there will be any sort of punishment for a person like that or that he won't get let out to kill again. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to find my serial killer dead on the page when it's all over. But <laughs> we're going to need you dead or locked up, sir. We can't we can't have this. <laughs> I know. Well, as I said, it doesn't speak well for my sense of humanity. No, I, maybe, but I'm, I hear that. It's just like, you know, I mean, and, and that is, that's true. The, the trauma, you know, there's the crime, there's the victim who is gone. And then there's the, you know, the law, that long, dark tale of trauma, mm -hmm. you know, for everybody who's left behind, you know, and that's kind of, that's another, you know, sort of big theme of, of Christmas presents. It's like this, you know, if you don't face it down, if you don't do the work, then the trauma starts to con can start to consume you. Well, one of the things that you point out, and this is a very common thing, is that um, uh, Madeline can't remember the whole mm -hmm. the whole terrible thing where she is badly yes. hurt, her friend is killed in front of her, and people disappear. And very mm -hmm. often, um, victims of trauma or people who are in terrible accidents or same thing. You know they they don't have any memory, so she is not in any way a, a reliable witness to what. No, happened. no, absolutely not. And I mean, and it's true of you know, I mean, obviously it's true in the case of you know traumatic brain injury that there might be you know gaps in memory, but it's also true of extreme trauma that mm -hmm. there's a type of dissociation that occurs. So you might have a feeling that you can be triggered by anything that your brain identifies as a threat. Like it could be that before your like moments before your trauma, you heard the ticking of a clock. And then every time you hear the ticking of a clock, you experience some type of terror or fear, but it's disassociated from the actual memory of the event. Right. Also, you might have a memory of the event and not have any emotion attached, not have any emotion attached to it or not have the right emotion attached to it because it's just like a, it's a separation. It's a splitting of the psyche that occurs to, as a self-protective measure. Right. And, so, yeah, go on. Sorry. No, no. And, and that it's the, you know, and there's work to be done and that can be done to, to reintegrate, to reintegrate the memories and the feelings and to, in, to narrate them in a sense, in order to make sense of them and to move forward from the past into the present moment. So what we have, and basically the structure of your story is that there she is in her bookshop, it's almost Christmas, and right. Harley Granger shows up. And so there's going to be a forward moving narrative, but really a big part of the story is and Madeline has to travel through that's right what happened to her and you know travel through it up to the present so it's a two track story in that sense that she's learning about um what she can't remember and okay. you know and of course it turns out to be a considerable surprise um so right um you know i i i find that story structure really interesting and and quite moving and you recognize that even though she didn't want Harley to walk into her bookshop and bring it all back. This is the only way she's ever going to integrate her life with what happened and where right. she is. Right. Um, exactly. And, you know, however painful that will be. Um, and to do that, um, I think, do you think that the small town setting is really important for that? Or does it really matter whether you're in a neighborhood in a city or whether you're in this small town that, that you've set your story? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think it really, I mean, in terms of it, your individual journey through trauma and healing, I mean, I don't think it really matters where you are, but I think in the case of, of Madeline, she's, she's uh, supported, you know, in a way that I think is, is helpful to anybody who is, is suffering. Like she's got, you know, her father who, you know, it ha has suffered a stroke and, um, he has been obsessed with this case since it since it uh, occurred and it's basically, you know, destroyed his health and he's, you know, he's he's obsessed with it, but he's there, you know, he's been there for her. They have um, their uh, his nurse and and her and their family friend and she has Badger, you know, he has all these relationships that that bolster her and sustain her in some ways they might keep her 
walked in the past, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like sort of the way of being in a small town, you know, you're always the person that you were then you never get to become the person that you are now because nobody can, nobody can adjust their image of you. So there's a little bit of like sort of arrested development there for her. But I think once she's on that journey, like having the support of that group and that town, I think, you know, is a bol is a bolstering um, element for her. Yeah, it's true that you're stereotyped by who you were as yeah. a child. It's like, you know, many men can't move past, you know, their high school athletic career or they're That's always right. known as, you know, <laughs> the guy that made the critical touchdown or the guy that fumbled the pass and lost, you know, the game, yeah. whatever it all is. It, it is hard to um, escape from that. But I think, you know, you've touched on it. I think it's important to recognize that her father has his own journey, you know, yeah. that even though he's had a stroke, he was um, the person who was supposed to find out what happened. Right. And, you know, fact, so, it is, it haunted him. Yeah. I mean, and that's been enormously stressful. Now, where is Madeline's mother in all this? Well, so Madeline, Madeline's mother has left. So she and her father divorced and Madeline's mother has, you know, sort of decided that she needs to go off and live her best life as a, a yoga teacher. And um, she, you know, she has essentially um, abandoned Madeline and also um, her husband, but not in like you know, sort of in a slightly more layered way. Like I just sort of, I envision their relationship as being like, you know, her, her needing to be herself, be who she was and leave this town. And he being so ensconced in the town that he couldn't leave because it was such an essential part of her identity and of his identity. And so the split is like, you know, and the, the idea of like a mother abandoning her child is so horrific, you know, but in this case, I kind of felt like Madeline's come to terms with it in some ways. And, you know, and she's, she knows that, you know, her mother, her mother has come back at critical moments when, you know, horrible things have happened. So it's like um, a, another relationship that, that Madeline is working on. And like this moment where you start to see your parents as people, and not as your, you know, not as your parents, not as like some extension of you and not you as some extension of them, but they're people who had dreams and let those dreams go or follow those dreams or whatever it is. And um, like, that's another moment in the book for, for her as well to kind of make peace with um, those relationships, however, however flawed they are. Well, that's very true. But basically you have sidelined the two people that, you know, you would most expect to be supporting her. Dad's right. had a stroke and right. she's taking care of him and mom isn't there, which right. means that Madeline is on her own or she has to rely on a childhood friend. And then, you know, she has to deal with Harley. Is he going right. to be a friend? Is he going to be, you know, a disruptor? What's all that going on? So, you know, and, and as you pointed out earlier, the holidays always, you know, amplify all these things because, you know, we do all have this kind of stereotype of, you know, everybody sitting around the tree with mugs of cocoa in our jammies and opening exactly. presents. And, you know, there's no there's no family dissension or whatever it is. And it is yeah. indeed a very difficult time for people who are grieving or families that are splintered or. Yes. You know, because we're supposed to be happy. That's the thing that's so that's hard. Right. Like tyrannical, you know, you must be happy. You must be wearing matching pajamas. You right. know, hopefully you've written some type of song and performed it for TikTok with your, you know, toe-headed children and whatnot. So it's like, and even more now, like there it's, I think there's even more tyrannical now with social media you know, you have these like Instagrammable, you, everyone's expected to have like, you know, their Instagrammable holiday moments or whatever. And if you, and, and then you're of course subjected to all of that online, watching everybody's, right. you know, two dimensional life and comparing it to your very messy three dimensional life. And it's not a recipe for uh, mental health. Let's put it Let's put it that way. So I think well, that you just made a case for why I have absolutely no personal social media. 
my only social media is I do the bookstore Instagram, but other than that, I don't do it. And you know what? It saved me an enormous amount of stress and grief. And it does make it hard for me sometimes, though, when, um, you know, a, a, a new book comes by and it turns out, you know, that whoever the stressed out heroine is, she's traumatized by Instagram and all her neighbors who are having, you know, perfect lives and all. I'm going, I don't get it. You know, I don't get it. <laughs> I'm not there. You know, I don't care. Um, I, it's an interesting choice about, you know, how much of our lives we want to live in a, in a digital world and how, you know, how much we want to expose. I know there's a, a couple I won't name, and I think their children are 100% on Instagram. I mean, from almost the moment the child was born yeah. and the older children, and they are ruthlessly on Instagram every day, multiple mm. times and all. And those children are, you know, a newborn. They can't give permission for that. They don't have any idea what's really happening. And I often wonder, um, and we've seen some of it, what will happen when they grow up and they look back and realize, you know, that their lives have been, public spectacle. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lot. I mean, I do a lot of thinking about it because I, I mean, I wind up writing about it a lot because it's such a big feature of our culture now, you know, and I, I personally like all my Instagram, all my social media is, is, you know, as my life, my life as an author, like I don't have a personal Instagram page and we were really strict with, we were really careful about what we shared about our daughter um, as, as she was growing up and we were really strict about the limits that we set for her, right. um, to the degree that, you know, she didn't have a phone until eighth grade and, uh, she didn't have any social media at all until the pandemic. Um, because we knew eventually we'd lose the battle, but sure. that we wanted her to have better hat. We wanted her to have good habits so that she did other things first before always reaching for, that and I think that that we've been successful in that. But you know, I always did really think about that, not just, um, you know, in social media, but what I write about her. You know, because at you know at a certain point in your life, she you're a mother and she's your child, and you know I have written extensively about you know balancing creativity and motherhood. And, you know, all the different things that I, you know, I, I did to try to achieve that, that balance. And, you know, it was only until, you know, once she was like in, you know, sixth and seventh grade, and then her friends are reading my books, and then her friends are following me on Instagram, and all right. that stuff. And then I start to, you know, really think about, wow, you know, like I can't write about her, you know, because she is her, she has become, she is her own, she is her own person now. Right. And, and it's definitely something that you, we have to think about as parents. It's like, they're not consenting to this, you know, um, documentation of their lives for public consumption. They're not consenting to that. And that you may have a reckoning with them when they come of age and they ask you to defend your decisions about what you shared. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I've noticed that, you know, as facial recognition is picking up speed, there've been some, a lot of conversation about um, protecting your children, you know, hiding their faces if you're doing yeah. any kind of posts or something. I think, um, I can't remember where it was I was reading about it, but parents making decisions to, you know, not expose their children's faces because, you know, that that's a lifelong that's a lifelong thing. You know, privacy, as we used to know it, has largely been shredded. I mean, I can tell you, you know, just having come back from Canada, that you can't travel without a smartphone and everything now, you know, you've become your own passport. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, That's with right. Global reentry, the whole bit. I mean, of course, it doesn't work if you aren't part of global reentry because they don't have your face then. But if you do, right. You know, right. now you walk in and you smile at the camera and, you know, there it is. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the just a different world, you know. And then the technology is just changing so fast. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we've talked about this before. It's like the uh, the technological advancements that have occurred in the last, you know, 50, 100 years are astronomical and, you know, the human brain has uh, advanced not at all. <laughs> Not even a little. Oh no, that's true. But nonetheless, <laughs> it's like you, your brain can is not yeah. designed to handle 
the amount of input and the tech and the and the advances of technology that are we are we're in the wild west now and how thing how our image is going to be used and, and what's going to happen with AI and all of that and and how like you say you know your body becomes your passport you know you're they're scanning your retina like whatever it is you know we're not prepared for for these shifts in technology so no, it's, and it's very challenging for a crime writer too you know to try yeah. to keep up bob degoni and i were talking about that last night he just invented the score that he's taking a break by writing in 1930 something his you know right. Seattle <laughs> mystery you know because he doesn't have to deal with all that and yeah. I yeah. think, you know, historical fiction offers us a respite you know, from, from having to think about or deal with, but it presents other problems. You know, I mean, no right. age was, you know, then you have no. You know, no. The technological advances in medicine, for example, are, you know, phenomenal. That's and right. you know, I'm watching you here without wearing glasses and all, because when I had cataract surgery, I had retractable lenses put in and I see better than I did when I was eight years old. You right. know, I can read the type on the computer and I can I can read if there were a banner across the street, you know, on top of yeah. the house, I can yeah. read that too. And I mean, I find that just to be amazing. It is. It is amazing. Next, is. next frontier, next frontier is audio. Um, yeah. Because now there are all kinds of studies that say that the brain can't adapt to audio technology past a certain point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I have to think about, about that, you know, at some point if I yeah. resist the thought of, audio support, you know, will I then not, not get it. So we're having to make decisions, um, you know, about things that, that were never absolutely place before. And, and you do too, as a writer. Anyway, um, I really, I think, you know, all kidding aside, and she hasn't ruined Christmas. This is a great <laughs> story. Um, it's a different Christmas story, but it's actually quite a moving Christmas story, and I can recommend it. Why don't we call Jacob up to see if we have any reactions from the audience? Okay. Well, may you all be going scrinch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few questions. Um, Robin Stoll asks if this is an anthology or that this is a standalone. Um, this is a this is a standalone. Although I I have a feeling Harley Granger is going to come forward. Yeah. And um, Robin asks, is this more of a mystery or a thriller, or both? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both, actually. I think it's a little bit. I mean, and and I guess it's you know I I often talk about the idea of genre, like what is a thriller, what is a mystery, what is crime fiction, what is a cozy, what is a not you know not what is not cozy. I mean, these are all you know of course labels that are assigned to a work by you know by your publisher because they need to be able to sell the book, they need to be able to tell people what it is. But I do think that this one is. Is a, kind of a is kind of very particularly a blend of thriller um, and mystery in that there's you know something very um, something very urgent that's happening in the present you know that there's a, a suspenseful element to it and that there's also a mystery from the past that is being unraveled so I'd say that there is a little bit of a blend of of both of those things in the story. I really dislike labels. They are largely put on there for digital um, book sales. They have to exactly. be books have to be tagged by certain things. But okay. you know, I I really think you know fiction is fiction, and I'm I'm sad that we have to talk about it oftentimes in those very targeted terms. So yeah. we don't we don't shelve things by labels at the That's point. Right. You know, we put it all in fiction except for science fiction. You know, something really distinctly different. Right. Um, and I think I think that works very well. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think that when you sit down to write, you know, like for me, like I, I, I've been writing since I was a kid, you know, I never thought of myself as a as a mystery writer or any other kind of writer. I just always had these, you know, this love of that sort of form of, of story. And I don't think any writer sits down to write. A, you know, to write a mystery or a thriller or a cozy or whatever. They're just, you know, in their space creating, um, creating character and story. And, you know, maybe it falls into one box or the other or both. 
And I tend to, you know, sort of like to experiment and to, you know, to look at different layers of awareness and, um, you know, psychology and like, you know, altered states, you know, whether it's addiction or fugue or disassociation or, you know, maybe even occasionally sometimes flirting with the so-called supernatural, but only in the most Jungian possible way. <laughs> so like, you know, I just think there are so many more questions about people in the human brain than there are answers, you know, and so that, you know, that's part of the mystery of life too, is to kind of be able to explore, you know, those elements in, in my fiction. So I think it's, it's difficult to, to categorize, but in this case, definitely a blend of the two. Anything else, Jacob? You know, we have a lot of comments, um, a lot of people excited for the book, but that's it for questions. All right. I'm happy to say, Lisa, that I'm seeing kind of a, some people call it a mashup or, you know, a fusion and all, but I, I do think that we're getting away um, from really rigid boundaries in many cases. Yeah. And we're, we're getting, I think part of it is that fantasy and horror have made a tremendous you know, right at the moment, they're kind of the dominant along with romance, um, yeah. more so really than mystery thriller has been for yeah. a while. Um, and I think, you know, those are really fusions of of different things, you know, that kind of storytelling. So I like that. You want your writers to have that freedom, you know, because that's where the real innovation and creativity lives. You know, like if you're always trying to I think that there's like a, occasionally from the publisher, like some idea that readers can't pivot or readers can't, you know, um, need to be, it needs to be one thing for a reader or something else for this reader. And I think that, you know, so many readers are, you know, especially as you say now with so much horror and fantasy making like such a big resurgence, you know, um, I think it's um, appropriate that we just sort of let writers write what they need to write and let readers decide what it is. That's a very well put. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you all for joining us. Let me remind you again that this is a marvelous stocking stuffer. Lisa has been very kind to sign our copies. Thank you for doing that again, Lisa. And I hope we're going to see you in March. We haven't gotten quite that far yet, have we? Oh, but I hope so. Yeah, I certainly hope so. We will, we will figure it out. Anyway, let me wish everyone watching this a very happy Halloween. And um, <laughs> go and buy a witchy book or a scary story or whatever <laughs> while these books are in transit. So, um, and have a safe Halloween as well. So good night, everyone. Thank you so